Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat podcast. We are going to have an absolute fantastic day today. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and we are here with Matt Welch. He is the State Director for the Conservative Texans for Energy Innovation, and I mean, this is exciting. I've really enjoyed getting to meet Matt and start working with him. Matt, thank you for stopping by the podcast. You bet, Stu. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, share with you what's going on in energy and electricity and a variety of clean energy endeavors across Texas that we're working on. So thanks for having us. Oh, great. Can you explain a little bit about what Conservative Texans for Energy is or Conservative Texas for Energy Innovation? Tell us. Absolutely. Be happy to. So the easiest way to... um, kind of understand where we're coming from is you take the Green New Deal and you throw it in the trash. (laughs) And then you come back to the drawing table and you build a agenda that is reasonable, uh, affordable, appropriate use of energy, electricity. Um, And so that's where we are. We are occupying kind of the center right space in Texas for um, proposing, evaluating, and adopting um, well thought out, well intentioned, well planned uh, policy solutions that uh, make the free market uh, the centerpiece of it, rather than the government telling you what kind of car you have to buy or what sort of energy source you have to have. How oh, cool! So we are for all of the above. And a little bit of the below, because Texas is on the cusp of a geothermal breakthrough. And so all of the above and a little bit of the below, that's what we're about. And as Texans uh, have realized painfully over the last year and a half, when you put all your eggs in one basket and that basket freezes, you got frozen eggs. (laughs) So it makes all the more sense to diversify your eggs. And that's what we like to talk about is... No uh, undue reliance or inappropriate reliance on one particular energy source. And, right. I, you know, we're, we're for not punishing an innovative source. We are for allowing a marketplace for new innovation, new technology to uh, be deployed in Texas. Right. And consumers have the ability and the choice and the freedom to pick which energy source they want to use how they want to use it. Um, And pretty soon, hopefully, Texas consumers will be making money off of uh, those energy choices. Um, And I think a perfect example is over the last week in Texas, we have received these nice notices from ERCOT saying, would you please conserve energy? (laughs) Well, uh, there's 25 million people in Texas, and I hope my instinct is not unusual, but I'm wondering, well, okay, I'll go turn down my thermostat to two degrees, but is everybody else doing that? And am I suffering uh, and just taking it for the team while everybody else is still cool in their house? So the fact of the matter is Texas pays industrial consumers to curtail their energy during times of stress and need. And why in the world should we not pay consumers to do the same thing? It doesn't make sense. We need to incentivize energy entrepreneurs and create a whole new mechanism for advancing our energy economy so that we we reward the people who are making the sacrifices. You know, Matt, that is cool. I I have really not heard that before. And it's really in an incentive because uh, climate hypocrisy drives me nuts. Yeah. When you see um, Al Gore and all of his buddies get in a jet, they fly all around the world, they use so much uh, carbon and fuel, and then they come back and tell us to you know, <laughs> ride a bicycle. Right. Uh, I, and it just infuriates me. And you're talking about the free market and incentivizing to save energy. That saves the environment. Saves the environment and it saves Texans from having a stressed out grid. Um, And, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting money in the consumer's pocket either. Exactly. Especially with what, 9.1 inflation yesterday. Oh, my goodness. We are we're in for a world of hurt. I hope um, 
folks wake up in November to the realities we're confronted with and figure out where they want to put their eggs and in whose basket? Well, you know, um, we talked about climate uh, hypocrisy and in your stance with the conservative Texans for energy uh, innovation is refreshing because I've been saying for years uh, that we need to have all forms of energy. We need to have the lowest kilowatt per hour to consumers with the least amount of impact. And we don't care what you use, nuclear, oil and gas and everything else. Oh, by the way, if the market decides it, you're gonna have oil and gas in that mix. Absolutely, it should be part of the mix. Um, and you know, coal is a important part of our portfolio right now. Right. Um, there are assets in Texas and the Texas thermal fleet that uh, are still using coal and that's okay for now. Right. The tipping point, at least for our organization, is when those assets no longer make financial sense. Right. Of course, we're still concerned about the environment, but our perspective mm -hmm. is uh, why would you use that source if it is an economic albatross around ratepayers' necks? Um, mm -hmm. And so, so there, we have advocated, for instance, in San Antonio, uh, CPS's uh, spruce coal plant it needs to be retired or repurposed because it is costing ratepayers way more than it's worth. And that's right. not right. Um, so, you know, use the resources that you have while they make sense, uh, but be prepared to make changes for progress and innovation down the road. Because look, right. life and the globe and America, it's a constantly evolving ecosystem, to borrow the left's word, you know, we don't ride around in horses and buggies anymore. We've made the move. Some mm -hmm. people don't like electric vehicles because they, I don't know, for various reasons. I mean, they have range anxiety, whatever. Right. And my, our point is, if you don't like it, don't buy it. Right. But right. don't stop some who want to buy it from buying it. And, you know, what I would say is, good luck in 25 years getting your carbon your a combustion engine vehicle repaired uh, in about 25 years, because I don't know right. if there'll be too many mechanics who do that anymore. But yeah, we need to we need to think ahead in all things energy and electricity. But, you know, we're sitting here, Matt, with the climate hypocrisy that drives me nuts. Uh, and that is they're all trying to force us to drive EVs. Average cost for an EV is what, $58,000, $60,000. And you're getting and you're getting a rebate. Some some person who lays out sixty or seventy grand right. for an EV is not the kind of person who needs a rebate it's from the a, government. Exactly. And then the rare earth minerals, we we won't. They're only what one percent of the cars, whatever the number is. And then we we if we try to go all EV by 2025, 20, 2035, 20, we don't have enough rare earth minerals. I, I mean, this you know, the crit critical minerals is a huge issue across the spectrum from energy reliability to national security uh, right. and, you know, cyber crimes and whatnot. And there are undue influences um, in the marketplace right now. And I'm talking about uranium supply. Right. Uh, and so it's something we need to pay attention to. We need to explore to a greater degree bringing more mining and exploration to the United States so that we are not overly reliant on foreign sources for those critical minerals. How does the Texas uh, conservative Texans uh, help with that kind of thing? Awareness. Um, we spotlight projects that are uh, potentially on the drawing board and highlight them and give them a tremendous amount of encouragement that domestically supplied critical minerals is the way to go. Right. Um, and so we, in, for lack of a better phrase, we provide cover for bringing that manufacturing back to the United States so that we can control our own resources. And I think a perfect example of being um, untethered to our ownership is the whole COVID vaccine uh, drama that we went through when we had so many foreign countries, primarily China, uh, having control over the supply of pharmaceuticals. 
it made no sense that somebody was asleep at the switch. We should not have become that dependent on so critical of a resource. Well, you you just described the whole supply chain failure. Uh, Was it? I can't remember when uh, we went to a just in time inventory, worldwide just in time inventory, and that made everything a global interaction. And then when the Ever Given just absolutely blocked the uh, the Suez Canal, that kind of went, whoa, we got a problem. Right. I don't think we've recovered from that. (laughs) Until the next one happens. Oh, well, how funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, the, the, the fact is we've got to wake up to the, to the reality that people are trying to do America right. harm. And there are people that are at war with us. And whether we've declared it or not, they're spying on us. They're stealing our intellectual property. Right. They are um, monetizing our institutions of higher education to their benefit. Right. They're undermining our academia and they are acquiring ownership of traditional oil and gas and uh, renewable energy sectors and transmission grid resources. We just need to wake up and do a better job of protecting our own uh, future. Oh, absolutely. And and Matt, a couple of weeks ago, I think you and I were talking about uh, there was a military base around here with a wind farm right next to it. And China had bought the wind or tried to go through and buy the wind farm. I mean, we that's right, Stu. radios on them and yeah. you want a Chinese to own something right near a military. Base? Yeah, it's insane. And, and I'm happy to say that that particular project got stopped yeah, uh, yeah. in terms of the wind farm. So we're talking about uh, Laughlin Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas, Okay, uh, where the Air Force trains a large majority of its pilots to become combat um, certified. And right. right across the river was a huge tract of land owned by a, a Chinese businessman who has an active past in the Communist Party. And he's a former officer in the Chinese army. A very wealthy man. He paid a lot of money for that land, more so than he should have, but he owns it now. And he's attempting to do whatever he wants with it. And thankfully, We've got some leadership in the Texas legislature right. who realized it and helped put a stop to it to make sure that at least that aspect of our infrastructure wasn't vulnerable to foreign actors. Now, this same outfit has got their nose under the tent on other issues, on right. other resources. And so we're having to play uh, eternal vigilance with them and other actors Right. Um, you know, sadly, when the when the Permian gets distressed right. uh, and people need to sell, they want to make money off of that sale. And uh, we need to be mindful of okay. folks with large pots of money, i.e. China and right. Russian oligarchs coming in and buying uh, those distressed assets. We need to have a, a more robust conversation about um, who owns what. And I know that kind of... Right on its instinct might fly in the face of free market, but free market is good until it's not a free market. And when you have an actor, an institutional actor, like the government of China, who uses businesses to their benefit, um, we need to wake up to that fact. So, you know, you're, you're talking about something, Matt, that I think is not paid attention to right now. And then let me think national security. You know, go figure that out. I, and and that I applaud that because Texas, uh, we have what two and a half two million people here. We're a leader in the U.S. in so many ways. People are trying to move in here, um, even if you want to call it an invasion or whatever. Here, we're also having an invasion from New York and California, so we can't be that bad of a place to live. Are you talking um, about the legal invasion, Stu, or the illegal invasion? Both. <laughs> Just check it. Just check it. Uh, you know, that one's illegal, one's legal, and it drives me nuts. I hope they leave their voting policies away from us. Um, on, on the other hand, um, when you sit back and think, Matt, you have impact for the entire U.S., even though you're really focusing on Texas because of the leadership Texas has. We are looked to as a role model 
on energy issues, obviously Houston being the energy capital of the world. There's so much going on technology and development wise, offshore and onshore. Um, there is also uh, leadership in the United States in terms of uh, rulemaking policy development. So 25 years ago, we stepped off down a path toward deregulation of our electric utility grid. Right. And uh, the benefits have been tremendous in terms of cheaper, affordable, reliable electricity for right. Texas consumers. So we were one of the first to take that step forward. And each and every successive leadership in Texas, in terms of the governor's office, has moved the ball forward. Um, we had um, our competitive reinvestment energy zones, our CRES lines, okay. uh, that were built seven or eight years ago. Right. And thank God they were built because you know what? The phenomenal development of um, renewables has already filled up those lines. They are congested mm. already. It's, it's oversubscribed, if you will. And so we need to think about expanding our transmission so right. that we can move that energy from uh, places of less population to areas of need. Yeah. Um, so grid, one of the things we're working on is transmission. It's a huge challenge yeah. and we we have the ability to solve our problems. Right. We just have to get out of the way of government in terms of hamstringing the private sector to solving that problem. Well, you know, ERCOT is, is uh, you know, getting a black eye sometimes. Um, and I think they've done a heck of a job personally. Uh, I think that they're doing... Uh, things that the other two grid systems in the U.S. are not doing. And I think that does help show that the free market works. Um, and, and so I'm quite honestly uh, happy about the free market. And do you think that with ERCOT and being a free market will help um, solve the relationship in the whole energy process as opposed to the other two grids that are being more just knuckle down into policies? Great question. I think what you got to have in place is a leadership team that is forward thinking, Right. that the status quo is not where their vested interest lies, that they've got to be right. um, looking for every opportunity to improve what they're doing and right. bring in and adopt and adjust for new technologies. And so toward that end, just last week, the PUC launched up a pilot project on distributed energy resources okay. um, to begin the process of uh, adding to kind of our old way of distributing energy and kind of create these new opportunities to move energy around um, in a different way than what we're normally accustomed to. And to once and for all, finally begin the process of um, demand response uh, potential. So I, th I think I mentioned it earlier, if um, if the price point is high enough, I'm going to go turn down my AC right, and uh, make money. I'm going to wash my clothes at 3 a.m. if it makes financial sense to do so. Right. I'm going to charge my electric car, not that I have one yet, but I'm going to charge my electric car when it's the cheapest. Right. And so as you begin to incentivize this behavior, um, our, our energy and electricity system will change for the better. Right. And, you know, you got to give credit to ERCOT this last week, and we're in the middle of July in 2022 right. on this podcast. Um, they have done a phenomenal job of managing this particular crisis. Right. Um, and they are, they are experts at their job, right. but they're not people who don't need oversight or suggestion or encouragement to do the right thing. Um, because sometimes uh, even bureaucrats get way too comfortable in their, um, right. their way of doing things. And so we've, we've just got to adjust. Look, we've grown in population exponentially, Texas has. And nobody yeah. could have anticipated or prepared for this. And so as we try and catch up to the electricity demand that all these right. new residents of Texas have, We've got to figure out different ways to uh, provide energy and electricity. It can't be the same old um, resource and only that resource. You got to mix it up. 
Well, you know, on the on the grids and nuclear, we I think we do we only have one uh, operating nuke in Texas. Uh, we have we have four reactors at two facilities. Oh, two facilities. We have Glen Rose up in the kind of the Fort Worth area, okay. and then South Texas down in Matagorda County. And each and of those facilities has two reactors. Okay, and they're all running everything. All, well, it depends on the day, but yeah, they're all running. Uh, and thankfully, they're all running because we do have a tremendous amount of uh, eggs in the nuclear basket. Oh, absolutely. And what a baseline uh, for the grid. I mean, they are just steady, eddy. I mean, they pump it out nice. What do you all, um, you know, I can talk that way since I got a Texas license plate. What, what are we all, what are y'all uh, doing for advocating of nuclear as well? Well, it's funny that you say that. We have been involved with a number of the, I call them startups, but they're so well funded. It's uh, startups, not the right word. So there are companies like New Scale, and there are companies that Bill Gates is a part of. And there's okay. these kind of tip of the spear nuclear future entities. Nice. And um, what they're doing, as is the case with most technology, it gets smaller over time and it makes perfect sense. We don't have those. Nice big giant bag cell phones that we used to have. We've got the real tiny thing. And you know what, our TVs, well, actually our TVs are getting bigger, but that's not a good example. But anyway, technology gets smaller and more affordable, yeah. like the, the smartphone. I mean, yeah. the, the computing power, whatever. So there is a movement uh, toward um, mo small modular reactors. SMRs is what the term is. And yeah. That's where I think this industry is going, and it makes perfect sense. So right now, the reason why we aren't building more nuclear reactors is that it costs $10 billion each, takes right. 10 years to get a permit. What fool would loan money to a project with such uncertainty? You can't get anybody to back that project. Right. So that's why these... Um, these smaller projects, which are more affordable, can be brought online quicker, make perfect sense. Right now, as we speak, yep. there are pilot projects of small modular reactors going on in the United States. I think there's one or two in the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yep. Um, and then in Boise, Idaho, there's one I think that's in test phase. And on the docket uh, with FERC, I think are or the NRC, excuse me. I think there's about 10 or 11 more in the test phase. And what we're talking about is the That's potential. Huge. It's huge to put one of these to power like a, you know, the Northern half of Alaska, right? right. Go put a small modular reactor. Looks like a small water tower, to be honest. Right. It's, it's small, it's safe. Um, and it's kind of the wave of the future. So you can have a SMR power, power a small city or a large city. Right. And um, the fact that they're affordable and deployable is what's going to make the difference. So we're I making think. progress. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. slow and steady, but it's on the horizon. And of course, China has already done this. So they figured it out a little bit before us and acted on it. And it's one other area that we got to play catch up on. You know, I'd like to find out more information on what is going on in China. And I, I, it just is a, amazing to me that uh, people think China is our friend. And uh, <laughs> I tell you, the only people who think China is our friend are immediate members of the Joe Biden family. Oh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I can go there, but most other people have a healthy, um, a healthy, it, by the way, so it's observation okay. of, of, the, of China. And you know, Stu, it's also a function of the public just doesn't know. I mean, I read all the clips of espionage right. corporate espionage uh industrial theft right um i think um the f-35 strike fighter right uh the Ch chinese stole it and have copied it successfully and so yeah uh, we need to have a more of a wake-up call for folks figuring out that china is not our friend well you know we ought to set something up in the future on something like this because this this is such a huge topic i think you know Talking about the undue influence of China on Texas energy and electricity grid is a is a fantastic topic for a future discussion. 
Oh, uh, unbelievable. And, and people don't realize that uh, on a side note on energy and, and oil and gas in the geopolitical world, China is aligning itself with uh, Russia. And, you know, when we talk about the Iran uh, nuclear deal, who in their right mind is going to think that Russia negotiating that deal? Come on. Right. I'm sorry. I even I, I went to Oklahoma State, but that is no excuse to allow Russia to come in there and negotiate that. So Russia and China and Saudi Arabia are working together to move the dollar off of oil. And they're yep. gonna go to the you know Chinese. And so why are they our friends? And why why is President Biden over there? today visiting with the Saudis when he's practicing a fist bump. Matt, this just drives me nuts. So we won't take a photo of him shaking anybody's hand in Saudi Arabia. That's pathetic. Well, Stu, I hope you got your blood pressure monitor on because I don't want you to get stoked up by how much oh, this is infuriating. <laughs> uh, so take your pills, and, you know, <laughs> take a deep breath because it is infuriating. It is. It's you know, we could spend about 15 podcasts on the short-sightedness of our energy policy as it relates right. to this administration. Um, you know, the things that we have canceled, the things that we have not allowed, right. the things that we have done with our strategic petroleum reserve are unbelievable. And so, so I, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just uh, unfathomable to deal with that. And so, you know, one of the circle back to you talked about China, China's got this thing called the, I think they call it road and belts initiative, mm -hmm. road and belts. And they put a little seed money into various geographies all over the globe. Like they are the largest investor in the continent of Africa. Right. They're building airports, railroads, transmission infrastructure, you name a telephone uh, right. system technology. And they've got their hooks into these small to medium sized emerging Country. democracies or flat out dictatorships. And they gradually roll them up into the Chinese influence and exert uh -huh. tremendous control, exploit natural resources. And um, it's not a healthy relationship. And, and we've, we've just really got to put a stop to that encroachment. That, that is one. I, thank you for bringing that up. Um, when you take a look at the, uh, I was on a podcast yesterday with uh, Gregory Wrightstone, and I did not realize that the deforestation of the um, uh, rainforest was actually because of uh, China digging up uh, rare earth minerals in there for that very same reason. Sure. So I thought it was because, oh, they're burning it down for farming. No, it's yeah. China's in there digging for rare earth minerals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they've got a different mindset. Um, and, you know, they look every day for a way to take opportunity and advantage and kind of move forward over the United States. Um, and we've been asleep at the switch and we've got to wake up. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to a future discussion on that, Matt. And Matt, I am so glad that you stopped by this podcast. How can people get a hold of you? And what are things that you need from people? Well, I'll tell you, Stu, one thing they can do is go to our website. It's actually a long one. Uh, but if you type it out correctly, it'll work. So it's www.conservativetexansforenergyinnovation.org. There's a way to sign up for our newsletters. Good. There is a news um, roster uh, right. of... Uh, late breaking developments. We right. are coming into a legislative arena in January, a, a time period, you right. know, for your folks and listeners who aren't from Texas, we meet every other year for 140 days. So it's very hectic in wow. order to get something done. And so we're going to be playing offense and defense in the upcoming session of the legislature and moving the ball forward on some stuff that makes nice. it easier for consumers to make money, um, to make price more affordable and reliable and kind of playing defense against the um, the big monopolies that are not looking out for everyone. 
Well, thank you, man. And I tell you, I had so much fun and I am really looking forward to our discussion on China. That is going to be fabulous. Thank you, Stu. I am too. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Thank you.